Hello, and welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists webinar series. We're honored to have you all here join, join us today and hope you may in, remain engaged throughout the series and take the opportunity to earn continuing education credits. My name is Louis Mantini, and I will be moderating for today's webinar. I'm an environmental scientist and work for the Swanee River Water Management District in Live Oak, Florida, and have been with the webinar committee for since 2017. The topic of today's lecture will be a broad scale 2,500 acre wetland habitat restoration project in South Florida. And it is our pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ed Weinberg. Ed is the founder and president of EW Consultants Incorporated, a natural resource environmental consulting firm based in Stewart, Florida, that has provided wetland and natural resource consulting services to private and public sector clients in South Florida since 1997. Prior to starting EW Consultants, Ed worked for 10 years with a large engineering firm. He earned his BS in biology from St. Bonaventure University in 1985 and an MS in oceanography from the Florida Institute of Technology in 1987. Over the past five to 10 years, the firm has developed a growing practice in the field of native habitat restoration and maintenance. And over the course of more than 36 years, Ed has developed a broad range of experience working in South Florida's unique freshwater and terrestrial natural systems. He has participated in a wide variety of jobs ranging from a few to over 5,000 acres, which include environmental assessments, environmental resource permitting, and habitat restoration. His extensive field experience has included wetland delineations, the determination of native habitat, and wildlife evaluations on over 100,000 acres throughout Florida. Based on this experience, Ed has focused the firm's efforts on meeting market demand for sustainable rest restoration of native ecosystems in South Florida. With that said, I will turn this over to Ed. And thank you, Lewis. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. So um, as Lewis said, I'm gonna talk our way through a uh, habitat restoration project we are in the middle of here in South, South Florida um, at a, in a project called Avenir. Uh, and with that, I'm just gonna get started and move along as quickly as I can. Um, first, a little bit of the background and, and regional perspective. Um, Avenir overall is a mixed use development project on about 4,765 acre parent property. Um, of that parent property, over 2,400 acres was designated as conservation and habitat restoration area. Uh, so over 50% of the property being left undeveloped and being restored from some uh, rather degraded conditions. Uh, the approval process for Avenir began in 2013. And as seems typical over, over the course of five years, the, uh, the final permits and approvals uh, that designated these conservation areas were received from the local government, which is the city of Palm Beach Gardens, uh, the state, which was in the form of a water man South Florida Water Management District environmental resource permit, and uh, federal a permit through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and Late, it was, I believe, August of 2018 was the last permit. And uh, with that, we geared up and start th started this habitat restoration process in January of 2019. Uh, here's an overall aerial photo. Um, and what I'm going to focus on today is the hatched area on here, which is uh, what we does call the North Conservation Area. This obviously is the development area within Avenir. There's another 300 acres of wetland restoration going on down here, but I'm, I'm gonna focus on this part of it today because number one, we've made the most progress there. And, and number two, it's, it's the most relevant, if you will. And we'll, we'll see that as we look at the regional perspective. So the, the regional setting of this, uh, these conservation lands is, is one of those opportunities we had to uh, make one and one equal three. Um, this conservation area was for decades considered a, a missing link in a, in a very comprehensive uh, public and municipal state 
et cetera, acquisition and, and management program throughout this part of Florida. And so that's, that's demonstrated here in this graphic. Um, in, shaded in green are areas that are in some form of public ownership and nat native habitat management, um, beginning here in the west at, at Lake Okeechobee, progressing here through an area called Dupuy, the JW Corbett Wildlife Management Area, the Loxahatchee Slough and associated properties. But essentially, here's where that Avenir North Conservation Area occurs. And, and that's why we kind of describe it as a missing link. Uh, another 2,100 acres that was able to connect these thousands of acres on both sides that essentially connect systems from Lake Okeechobee all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and so the, the, the background and, and, and sort of motivation for a lot of those conservation programs is the Co Co Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Program, which has been in development, design, and implementation for over 20 years at this point, you know, an overall 18,000 square mile project. Um, this particular uh, element of the project is the Loxahatchee River Watershed Restoration Project. Um, and from the Chief of Engineers, the Corps of Engineers, Chief of Engineers report, uh, some of the main goals of that were restoring freshwater flows to the Loxahatchee River, which uh, is a designated national wild and scenic river, restoring over 27,000 acres of freshwater and estuarine habitats, and as you saw from that graphic, uh, you know, improving connectivity over 78,000 acres of, of existing natural areas. And so this is a, a map excerpted from that Chief of Engineers report. And, and once again, um, you can see here is a, the, our North Conservation Area at Avenir and all of this public ownership and publicly managed lands to the west and to the east, stretching again from Lake Okeechobee to, to the Atlantic Ocean. And, and this just really was that last missing link. There were multiple attempts at public acquisition. The previous owner of the property was, uh, was not open to that idea. And so as the, the Avenir project progressed, it became a, a natural opportunity to achieve that last link in this uh, corridor of, of conservation. Um, the, the property itself um, had been in agric agricultural uses for decades, um, easily back into the 50s. And that the progression of, of how that often goes on here in, in South Florida is um, on blocks of four, maybe 500 acres at a time, there are, uh, they are cleared, graded, ditched and drained for row crops and winter vegetables. And as those fields phase out, they go to another four or 500 acres and begin cattle grazing on the, uh, on the remaining property. So, when we got started, this is uh, a picture of what it looked like. Uh, plenty, plenty of cattle grazing throughout the property. The vast majority of it had been cleared and was um, in, in uh, improved pasture, um, primarily forage grasses and um, non-native vegetation. Uh, the, the basics of these kinds of agricultural operations, uh, especially here in South Florida, is to accelerate drainage in, in response to rainfall. We have a very distinct wet and dry season here um, and get a lot of rain, 55 to 60 inches a year. And so uh, accelerating drainage is needed to facilitate the agriculture. Uh, and then that same infrastructure is used to deliver irrigation water when it's needed for crops or cattle. So this is kind of what the typical farm ditch looks like um, out on the property. Man dug ditch, uh, spoiled on the sides and a, a drainage culvert crossing under farm roads and those kinds of things. Um, the, the main drainage canal, about three and a half, four miles long through the center of the site, um, very highly improved and maintained. Um, you see, you know, boy, there's a lot of fencing out on this property uh, over decades of, of cattle grazing. Um, and the, the bigger the canal, the bigger the road that's built next to it for access throughout the farm. And so as we started with this program, we, uh, we start with goal setting and, and the approach was to use reference systems that were in the same geographic area 
Uh, and we were fortunate that um, there's an adjacent property just to our east. We share about a two mile boundary with a, uh, a property that's owned, managed uh, for native habitat by Palm Beach County. And so the existing conditions in the restoration area were characterized by invasive species and agricultural drainage. And I'm just gonna give sort of some before and after photos here. So these are our pre-existing conditions prior to starting restoration. That big shrub in the front is Brazilian pepper. Um, one of the scourges of, of South Florida, this is a melaleuca tree in the background. And uh, you can see a few native slash pines, but for the most part, very, uh, very much dominated by invasive non-native vegetation. It's a little more broad perspective view uh, out into the pasture areas. And you can see again, the occasional cabbage palm, but otherwise um, non-native. And so just for perspective, I, the next set of photos of the Sweet Bay Natural Area, which is adjacent to our east, uh, I took from the exact same location. I was standing on the roof of my truck and just turned 180 degrees. Uh, so compare what you see here. Um, fantastic. Wet prairie, freshwater marsh, native uh, system, pine flatwoods in the background. Um, and so this is what our reference system became in terms of goal setting for the habitat restoration. Uh, another here, and one of the things that, that you'll note is Palm Beach County has a very well established prescribed fire program. These, these areas have been burned, which is a, a, a natural occurrence here in South Florida. Um, and so that set up our, our goals for how we would proceed with this restoration. Um, so on to the two main elements of the, the restoration approach. The first is uh, eradic eradication control of invasive vegetation species. Um, and there are some unique challenges here in South Florida where, where we're in a subtropical climate. The growing season is basically 365 days a year. Uh, we may get a hard freeze as in below 32 degrees for maybe 24 hours every two or three years. But uh, some of the growth rates slow, but we, things grow all year. Um, and being the, uh, the international destination that South Florida is, we have introduced species from all over the world. Um, and one of the results of that is just an unlimited seed source, whether it's external to the site or legacy conditions in the soils on the site. Um, just a few of the the main targets, if you will, primary targets in the uh, eradication of invasive species, the melaleuca tree, which I think I showed you one there in that previous picture, evergreen tree that can grow to 80 to 100 feet tall, um, native to the Australia, um, that continental uh, Pacific area. But a single tree, mature tree, is capable of producing about 20 million seeds per year. And they are tiny, tiny seeds. They're in pods. They can blow in the wind. So there's, when I, when I talk about infinite seed source, that's, that's one of the problems. Um, the melaleucas typically invade and occur in wetland uh, inundated habitats. Uh, the earleaf acacia is, is more characteristic of upland areas, but a tree that can grow six to eight feet per year and reach 40 feet in what feels like no time also native to that uh, Australia, so that South Pacific area. And those mature trees, again, produce very small seeds, 47,000 seeds per year. Um, and then finally, I, I showed that picture with the Brazilian, but, and by the way, <laughs> this is no long, no mean, by no means an exhaustive list. It's just a couple of the major species that we try to deal with. Uh, the Brazilian pepper, which is a shrub and small tree, comes up to about 30 feet in height, uh, obviously native to Brazil and South America, um, and can occur in both aquatic and terrestrial habitats, which doubles the, the challenge that comes with this. Um, as far as seeding, the Brazilian pepper actually produces some red berries, and the, the old timers here in Florida call it Florida holly, um, but those are eaten by a broad variety of, of birds and, and wildlife, and they pass successfully through to, uh, to, to exit the animal still as viable seeds. So that's another dispersion that, that's difficult to control. 
Um, as far as techniques, there are pretty well established techniques that are used to, to try and eradicate these species. Um, herbicide application in basal bark, uh, some foliar, we don't do a lot of foliar application on, on these trees and, and shrubs because the, it, there's too much, uh, too much non-target uh, application. Um, the hack and squirt is sort of a unique method that we use on the melaleuca. It has a very papery bark. Uh, and so it's cut through that with a machete down to the cambium and apply the, the herbicide at that open spot within the trunk. Um, we've employed a, a great deal of uh, forestry mulching um, from skid steer mounted units that can essentially be very selective uh, to much larger track, track vehicle mounted units, uh, as well as conventional lane clearing and, and mulching uh, in some locations where it's just 100% cover, especially by Brazilian pepper, uh, just uprooting it and, and running it through a tub grinder is, is the best solution. And then, you know, the other major uh, type of uh, invasive species control needed is, is in grasses. Um, smut grass is primarily an upland grass, uh, a bunch grass native to, to Asia. And another one of those prolific seed creators, 1,400 seeds per panicle and 45,000 seeds per plant and easily 100,000 individual stems in an acre where, where it has invaded. Um, the torpedo grass is one that primarily occurs in, in wetland and aquatic systems, native again to Europe and Asia, but this is one that if it can spread, it can spread the rhizomes, stem fragments, uh, anything, and it's very difficult to, to treat because much of it is uh, submerged, and so you're trying not to apply chemicals to the water, but rather just to the, the leaves of that, that grass. Uh, and, and paragrass and, and African grass that uh, I'm not sure I've seen it eight feet in height, but easily six feet um, spreads once again by stolons cutting seeds. And so it it's, continues its march uh, unless you uh, begin the control immediately. And so with regard to the grasses, our primary means of control have been foliar herbicide application. Uh, many of these species we can uh, reduced by attrition, um, essentially mowing an entire area uh, makes selective application much easier. And, and in much of this um, long-term uh, pasture areas, there has been such a layer of thatch and, and compaction built up that we are disking into the soil surface to help with recruitment of native species from existing seed sources. And so the other major element of, of the restoration program is, is obviously hot hydrologic restoration. And so in our regional context, the, the drainage infrastructure here in South Florida was constructed under the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control Project, uh, authorized more than 60 years ago. And for anybody who's familiar with the uh, the uh, Kissimmee River, which was part of that project, you know, the, the, the beginning of the project was intended to straighten it and, and make it run faster. Uh, and by the end of the project, uh, the channel was backfilled and built back out into its floodplain. And so the goals have changed over the years, but uh, the, the results of the project are, we, we can't avoid and we have to operate. You know, it was designed as a flood control system. And what we're trying to do here with restoration is the complete opposite um, to try to recreate flooding. Um, here's just a, a quick map. And this is, uh, sorry for the quality of this. These older maps are difficult to get much uh, uh, definition in, but it shows this wide network of main canals, secondary canals, et cetera. The, the Avenir site sits somewhere in here um, and just uh, that's the challenge we have to work within. Uh, and so the hydrologic restoration approach is to reverse these decades of agricultural drainage improvements, uh, system of ditches, canals, and berms that are all connected to that regional drainage system. Um, and then, uh, you know, excavated ditches of, of different width, depth uh, are throughout the property. And in most cases, the spoil from the ditch is deposited adjacent to it in order to facilitate access throughout the farm or the range. 
And so as we started, um, there was the, the owners flew a custom uh, LIDAR mapping of the entire property, which gave us a real good uh, sense of elevation change, both across the property and, and within. Um, and then the, the hard work gets done on the ground, um, determining what, what we refer to here as seasonal high and normal pool water elevations in representative wetlands. The, Seasonal high when we get a four or five inch rainfall um, on, on a Tuesday and two, or two more inches on Wednesday and three on Thursday, we tend to reach a, a high elevation that's, that's ephemeral but occurs almost every wet season. And then the normal pool is where we really wanna be sure that we establish these, uh, the wetlands long-term hydro period. And so just how that operates in the field in this particular case, I think that's a, a three foot long survey lath and between where the seasonal high was set, we have field indicators and the normal pool might be, you know, 18 inches, two feet, um, which is a little challenging. Uh, and, and the typical field indicators, you can see the um, adventitious rooting on this, I believe is a wax myrtle out in the middle of a wetland and enables us to establish where that normal pool, the long-term inundation is in the wetlands. All of these uh, locate or elevations are measured in by survey. That survey was is rectified or, or worked within the LIDAR and that enabled us to start to establish a hydro, hydrologic restoration program throughout this whole habitat restoration area. And so our restoration elements um, to intercept and, and backfill existing agricultural drainage, uh, we thought sticking plugs in the ditches might work, but when we reach some of those uh, seasonal high events, they end up washing out. And so for the most part, we're, we're backfilling all of the old drainage ditches. Um, and at the same time, regrading the berms and roads to help facilitate more natural sheet flow across the site. Um, the elevation changes here in Florida are measured in inches, not feet. And so uh, it's a little, it's very important to try and reestablish these sheet flow to, to support all of the wetland systems within the, the overall conservation area. And then the, more broadly, we're increasing the control elevation in the restoration basins. We have two different control elevation basins in there. And you know the the uh, desired effects there. Number one, slow the rate of the runoff in response to rainfall. So all those agricultural improvements are to accelerate it, and we're trying to decelerate it. Um, and, and as a result, try and increase the depth and duration of inundation throughout. And that's both within existing wetlands um, as well as trying to to work those that inundation further out into areas that were wetland prior to all these drainage improvements. And of course, recreating natural sheet flow patterns. Um, raising the, the water table and surface water elevations is we're trying to get to historic natural conditions. We'll never quite get there uh, because of all that surrounding drainage infrastructure, but that's, that's the goal. And so in, in doing so within just that North Conservation, we've um, backfilled and regraded about 70,000 linear feet of canals and ditches. And, uh, and degraded, so leveled out and removed uh, about 74,000 feet of berms and elevated trails. So this is kind of what it looks like uh, in blue on here. E each of these are backfilled. This was our phase one area we've had complete now for about a year and a half. Uh, we're working our way through this. We still need to backfill that ditch and that ditch, but the vast majority of these have been backfilled and graded to meet surrounding grades. And just so you can see, this, this map includes what was determined to be wetlands out here before we started. We expect that to expand by about 30% once all these hydrologic restoration uh, ac actions are complete. Uh, and then sort of the opposite map, these are the existing uh, roads and trails that are elevated that we're degrading. Uh, once again, to match grade and facilitate sheet flow in the more natural direction. And so the, the other you know, major project is installing outfall control structures. Um, the two, di two different basins, that eastern basin, we expect to raise by about 18 inches from where it currently outflowed by gravity. 
Uh, and then the, the Western Basin, the larger of the two, will, will have an increase uh, at, at least 24 inches. Uh, and then in addition, the, the development area to the south has a fully functional and permitted stormwater treatment area that achieves state water quality standards through the, their treatment system and stormwater ponds and retention. And uh, ultimately that excess drainage is pumped into the restoration area. Um, and we're designing that to sheet flow back out and across for uh, extended inundation and, and to broaden those wetland areas. Um, and adaptive management has become my favorite part of uh, the habitat restoration business because for those of you not familiar with Murphy's Law, uh, it certainly applies in these projects. And that being if something can go wrong, it will, and it will always be at the worst possible time. And uh, if you leave things to themselves, they'll go from bad to worse. Um, so that, that's our mantra for adaptive management um, as we've worked our way through this. Um, one of the you know, first ones we learned, if you will, is um, you know, ap applying herbicide in, in order to be as selective as possible and minimize use of herbicide. Uh, we've developed a couple of different um, techniques. This weed wiper is one. Um, we noticed that after mowing, the, the smut grass grows much more quickly than many of the native species that are, that, that are intertwined with it. And so we came up with, uh, it's, it's an off the shelf array, but we're using it in a some, somewhat unique way that we, um, we mow a field that's a mix, mixture of, of smut grass and native species. We let that smut grass grow 18 to 24 inches. And then we take this tool, which is, uh, it's actually at full, full width can be 24 feet wide. This is a 12 foot central portion of it. There are two arms. Only one of the arms is mounted here. The other one would mount there. Um, a, a chemical tank with a pump system. And then this um, manifold system allows us to en en enable one or all of these bars that are a, a perfor perforated PVC pipe with a foam wrap around it. And essentially pulling this behind an ATV, we're able to treat the tops of all the most actively growing port part of the smut grass and have little to no impact on any of the, the native species that are present. Um, another one is, boy, the weather here. Um, we have a relatively distinct dry season from December to June, and everybody argues about what month that starts and ends, and, and a wet season from July to November. Um, we in many efforts, you know, with those backfilling of ditches, et cetera, tried to plan the earthwork efforts for the dry season so that um, we had drier ground to work with. But uh, we can get frontal storms that come through and drop four inches of rain overnight. And the dry season looks just like wet season in, in the middle of January. Um, and we've also done a lot of, you know, trying to plan our revegetation efforts for the wet season where Regular rain for fall helps that vegetation uh, establish itself. But even this, this past year, we went through an extreme dry spell uh, early in what should have been the wet season um, that made it very challenging. And so we're constantly adapting the timing of the efforts in response to daily and seasonal weather variability. Uh, and then we had that when something go, can go wrong, it will at the worst possible time. Uh, one of the forestry mulchers we were operating um, ignited an accidental wildfire in May of 21. Um, we were coming out of or still at the, at the very end of the dry season. And so combination of, of very dry vegetation and persistent winds resulted in about 300 acres that were um, wildfire burned. and because we hadn't prepared in advance in terms of lowering uh, vegetation heights and those kinds of things, it was an excessively hot fire, uh, which kind of looks like this. Uh, typically with a prescribed fire, we would, we would see a little bit more green uh, in a situation like that. And so this was a, it was a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Uh, we, we did at the time have an established system of fire breaks in place that the difficulty is that it was so dry and so windy that uh, embers could carry across that fire break without any difficulty. And so our fire break did its job, but it didn't do the job when it was that we hadn't prepared in advance. 
Um, so we decided to adapt uh, some of our techniques as a result. Um, that fire obviously opened up a lot of understory, uh, allowing us to co cover ground much more quickly. We shifted all of our ground crew work to that area, which was not a phase we were working in at the time, uh, to, to try and eradicate some of the fire tolerant invasive species. The melaleucas tend to just burn the bark off the outside and the tree's fine. Um, and then you know, we adapt the schedule and management activity to derive the maximum benefit from that unfortunate accident. Uh, that said, we have ongoing efforts now. We have a prescribed fire plan in place. We've established a number of units um, and we're maintaining those breaks so that we can be prepared when the conditions are right. Uh, there are some sensitive receptors in the area and so that presents challenges, but uh, as I showed before the, the Sweet Bay area to our adjacent to our east uh, has a very successful and ongoing prescribed fire program. So we know it can be done. Um, we are doing the best we can not to export any uh, biomass from the restoration areas. So the, the forestry mulching essentially mulches these invasive species and leaves that biomass in place to decay you know, back into the system. Um, we're tub grinding invasive species where we use uh, conventional clearing methods and spreading that mulch and disking it into the soil profile to add organics. Uh, and we are currently um, in, in some of the higher areas identified in that early LIDAR study, we're conducting some earthwork to help lower the ground elevations so that as we flood those, we'll actually get successful wetland recreation. Uh, and we are 90% complete with a, a perimeter containment burn to help close, uh, contain those elevated water levels that we've designed. Uh, we do, this is a uh, conservation area that'll be open to the public. And so we have established a, a trail system in the phase one uh, area of about five miles. Um, we're in the planning and design stages of the phase two, sale, phase two trail system that'll add about 10 more miles of trail. And that particular system will be integrated. We've met with some folks uh, into the Florida Trail, which is um, intended to try and connect uh, a, a hike from Lake Okeechobee to the Atlantic Ocean. And as you saw from some of those missing link maps earlier, we're, in, we're uniquely situated to help uh, accommodate that. And so with that, I'm going to try and run through a couple of these uh, photos that I've taken. They're always the exciting part and demonstrate some of the things I've been talking about here. Uh, this is right when we got started in January of 2019. We had mowed um, probably 120 acres of the original 300 acre restoration area. Um, and the purpose of the mowing is to, is to get down to and re or, uh, trigger new growth in the vegetation so that it's the most sensitive to herbicide treatment. Um, this is two months later after we had done a broad application of herbicide to those mowed grasses. We've had a successful kill here, and this is just about 99% non-native invasive species that we've sprayed. Uh, after that, we, we figured out that we needed to break up that thatch layer and, and reintroduce that material into the soil profile. And so by April, four months in, we had uh, disked this entire area. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we were using a tub grinder to, to mulch up invasive species. So we spread that out over the, the disked soil and then went back through and disked it back into the soil profile. Uh, and so we started with just about bare sand by, uh, by May, 9, May of 2019. Uh, and in the fortunate timing, if you will, um, the, the rain started to come. And so two months later, that's from the same exact location. Uh, we, this is the kind of vegetation establishment that, that occurs in a, a subtropical environment. Um, we then came in and started replanting native species. These are uh, flat slash pines that we've started to arrange here. This habitat system is a combination of wet and dry prairie that'll obviously react to water levels there, but um, one of my favorite habitat types in, in South Florida and um, the, the progression, we're very happy with nine months into this with uh, planting of, of some native canopy species on very wide centers and, and reestablishment of native grasses. And so 11 months in, this is uh, 
what we look like and you can if you look close we are starting to get that is a smut grass blade um, which is you know we, we're now into the let's get the last five percent instead of 95 percent uh, and this is 14 months after completion and so we've successfully established um, you know a combination system of wet prairie and dry prairie that um, very encouraging um, a lot of satisfaction when when this kind of stuff can get taken care of within just over a year. And so one of the species unique to South Florida is the crested caracara. And I forgot, Lewis pointed out, I misspelled that crested caracara. And this is difficult to see, but they, they nest in the crowns of cabbage palms. And so in the 2023 nesting season, which runs January to April, we, uh, we actually had a newly established nesting pair in that wet dry prairie habitat, which is their, their typical nesting area. Um, they hadn't been documented nesting in this area probably in uh, two decades. And so uh, very encouraging to pull in a, a threatened, federally, less, federally listed threatened species and reestablish a, a, a reproducing population. This is another one of the scourges. I, I did not mention the old world climbing fern, but um, herbicide application to this fern, which obviously can just smother everything in the way. Um, but within a month or two of having treated it, the, as the leaves drop, we get the uh, native species poking back through that it was previously smothering. Uh, this is an area where we backfilled a ditch and recreated a, a deep marsh. Uh, in fact, you can see some of that climbing fern has been treated here and that ultimately uh, decays and falls apart. But we did a minor degree of uh, native species planting in here, but much of it coming from the surrounding wetland. This ditch ran straight through the middle of a wetland. So we, uh, we backfilled the ditch and reconnected two different wetland polygons to, to recreate a much larger wetland. Um, also, you know, a gratifying part of this is seeing um, wildlife come back. This is an area where we had gone through and mowed and, uh, and native wetland grasses came back. You see, I think half a dozen or more wood storks in here, another federally, federally threatened species foraging away in the, the reestablished wetlands. Uh, we have numerous flocks and this dry prairie habitat again has enhanced the opportunity for wild turkeys. Uh, to, to reestablish and, and operate in the area. Um, we've, this is a, a marsh that we did really a minor amount of restoration. I'd call it enhancement work in there, but successfully uh, having Florida Sandhill cranes, which is a state listed threatened species nesting in there. Um, we have established a couple of locations with motion activated cameras, which helps us uh, capture the things we might, might not others otherwise see. Um, coyotes are somewhat ubiquitous out here. Um, a bobcat here, you can see in the foreground, this is, it's hard to see, but in the background is a, a, a wild hog trap. We do have a problem with, with wild hogs. They tend to root, tear up the substrate and root through the, so we have a trapping and removal program, but I think the bobcat would go around there and look for small hogs at night uh, as they came towards the trap. Uh, very vibrant population of white-tailed deer uh, and hopefully growing as we establish more and more habitat opportunities. And um, this was one that caught me by surprise. If you look closely, you can see a Florida black bear in that photo. Um, they, there have been a variety of what I might call random sightings in the surrounding area over the past 10 or 15 years. But those uh, habitat areas, uh, to the west, probably host bears, but you know that that importance of the missing link. We now know that we have them at least crossing through this conservation area uh, in a place they they really had not existed for decades. And no, you know, uh, Florida photo presentation would be complete without an alligator shot. This guy's uh, established his own island, and I'd recommend staying away. But um, Plenty of, plenty of alligators out here and, and we're glad to be moving them back into the systems they might normally and naturally occur in rather than the, uh, the ditches that we're trying to get backfilled. 
And uh, with that, one of my favorite photo ops, I, as I said, I, I love this dry prairie habitat in, in South Florida. And so on the way out one night, um, shot a quick picture and here we are. And with that, I'm more than happy to take questions and see where we're at. Thank you, Ed. That was a great presentation, man. Um, Thank you. I'd like everybody to know that um, if you have not yet posted your questions on the question and answer board, please do. I'm going to read them directly to Ed. And if you uh, if we run out of time, please take note of, um, of, Ed's, of Ed's email and you can send questions directly to him. Also, um, I, I placed in the chat uh, that Ed's slides will be uh, linked with the YouTube presentation when it's posted. So um, if you can't jot down this email, then, then you have is uh, you can look it up then. Um, so I want to start, I want to begin the question. All right. <laughs> and I didn't know what a, a tub grinder was before, before I saw your slides and, um, or I guess I read the description of the project and and I was pretty uh, pretty amazed at that piece of equipment. I, I I urge everyone to look it up if they get a chance and um, see it in operation, YouTube, whatever. But um, when when you mulch, when when you introduce the mulch to um, you know I, I guess bulk up the soil, uh, does that has that mulch been like composting for a little while? Because I'm 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 thinking. How do you keep like the the propagules from some from the um, invasive and exotic species from you know spreading and germinating? Well, so and and I think I mentioned you know the the legacy seed source here is such that we would have to do that whether we introduce the mulch or not. Uh, we have found that by disking that primarily woody material down six to to eight inches into the soil profile. We get very little regermination from that, and as as far as it composting, um, we a lot of it is stockpiled and then spread, but it's not a years long process by any stretch. Um, and and then it becomes the surveillance and watching, and and when you you have to pick out a few here and there, it's a much uh, it's a little more labor intensive, but it's a much more successful prospect. Okay. Well, on a related note, um, Diane Hall asked, "Did you seed in? Did you seed in native herbaceous species, or did they come in from the seed bank?" We did not seed anything. We did a lot of looking around and trying to find um, native seed sources. And I've worked with there are a couple of um, mitigation bank operators here uh, that that I work closely with, and most of them have tried in one way or another native seeding, at least here in South Florida, and you know, germination rates on, on the order of a hundredth of a percent um, and collection costs that are out of control. And so we have not done any native seeding, you know, that we've added. It's entirely recruited from the seed bank in the soil. Now that said, we, we did a lot. We did a planting of, of native species on very wide um, centers and then allow those to go to seed, which seems to be equally or more successful than trying to just plant the seeds ourselves. Um, anonymous attendee asks, what species did you plant in the deeper wetland? We've done very little planting in deeper wetlands. Uh, once again, that those areas tend to, to uh, recruit on their own if it's going to grow. Um, and we're uh let's what's the best way to put it we're not yet as deep as we'd like to be we we have still have to install install those control structures and finish the perimeter burns and so we're not 100 percent certain where our deepest areas are going to be right now okay um i have a question from a Kristen nowak uh who says that um she enjoyed your wonderful presentation um might have missed this but what was the impetus of, of, or funding source for this restoration project? So it is entirely privately funded. Um, the uh, it, the uh, at least a portion of the conservation area is serving as wetland mitigation for the impacts within the development area. So that is one of the impetus. But um, uh, over the course of 
uh, maybe the last decade, uh, give or two. Well, I guess if we started in 2013, at least the last decade. Um, th these larger projects in South Florida, the local governments have put a premium on provision of conservation lands. Number one, because their constituents want to have the opportunity to experience it. And number two, because it's the right thing to do. And, and so it, it's not a coincidence that more than 50% of this overall parent property was put into conservation. So that, that was a negotiated solution during the uh, land use approval process. And it's becoming more and more common. We're fortunate to be involved in at least two others where 50% uh, or more of a, a large, you know, three, 4,000 acre parent property has been designated for permanent conservation in, you know, in exchange for the entitlement to develop um, in the other portions of the site. And I think um, I did recognize in, in one of the plan views in, one, in the earlier slides that you have um, an actual overview of the, the development that's south and, and west of, well, south of the these uh, conservation and, and uh, preservation areas and, and um, the, uh, if I recall correctly from the, from the description, it's, it's a, it's a very, it's a mixed use type of development too. Yes. Um, the institutional recreation, uh, I mean, uh, um, commercial, residential. Res res residential, commercial, institutional, um, uh, Public parks, it's you name it. It's you know the intention of in I guess the 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 ethic of new urbanism to create a you know self-contained town, if you will. Um, Diane Hall also asked in in context of the um, of the restoration areas. How what do you have an estimate of the cost per acre? For the restoration that has been done so far, uh, in in gross acres, I would put it between two thousand and twenty five hundred per acre. Um, the, the it's difficult to apply it that way because. Um, for instance, in that phase one area, we had, you know, one wetland that was 50 or 60 acres that we, we finished cleaning up the Menelukan in a couple of days. Um, and then we stepped across a canal and we were in the same two acres for three weeks. Uh, so it, it, a, a per acre price is, is only, or cost, if you will, is only a, a, a gross estimate because it's, it's very site specific and, and challenge specific. Okay. Um, Nancy Makofka asks, says, excellent project and presentation. Wondering if you encountered any aquatic life when backfilling the ditches. If so, were there any efforts to save or relocate these organisms? Yeah, so the, the alligators were encountered regularly and they get themselves out of the way. Um, the, from a process standpoint, we um, established uh, erosion control um, floating turbidity barriers, et cetera, on, on the ends of the, the work areas that we had. And, and where we could, we, we, were, we would move aquatic life. There's, there's no doubt, you know, we lost some in backfilling the ditches, but, um, you know, for the most part, they're able to, to move and, and get out of the way. And um, so some efforts, but not a major effort. Yeah, I'm afraid that I'm crying for those. South American cichlids right now. Um, <laughs> well, and there's plenty of those. From uh, Marissa, Marissa Rain, or Rian, Mar Marissa Rian, did the smut grass recede as water table went up or was continued treatment required? I may have answered this, but um, just a little clarification. Yeah, so smut grass is a battle of attrition. And, and for instance, we're, we're finally getting a pretty aggressive wet season and um, higher water levels this year. And it, it definitely recedes. Um, when we first came out here and started doing wetland delineation, you could almost walk along the line of the smut grass to tell what was upland and wetland in, in many of these pasture locations. Uh, and so our long-term control 
uh, on that is the hydrologic restoration. As we expand the, the spatial extent of wetlands, we will continue to control and, and reduce the smut grass. And so then that isolates us to the dry prairie areas where it's continual surveillance. Um, you know, if you uh, apply and, and control well in a, in a maintenance event, you might get 80% of it. And the next time you're gonna get 80% of that 20%. And so it's a ongoing process. All right. Um, on a related note, anonymous attendee asks, um, I kind of had a question on this myself because um, there's a, how how will this uh, this project uh, affect um, or offsite? How how will the how will the um, lack of better word stormwater management be be done so you won't flood offsite properties? So we're, uh, I think I mentioned in, in that phase one area, we have fully completed um, a perimeter berm that is designed to contain a hundred year storm. And that includes what would be pumped out of the development area. And the, the Western, the phase two area, we're about 90% complete with that berm. Both of those berms will have a, an outfall control structure that enters that regional system I mentioned, the overall drainage system, and the, the permit for the projects limits the rate and volume through those control structures so that, you know, it, it's the, the approach, and Lewis, you're probably familiar with this, you know, pre versus post. You can't have any faster or more runoff post-development than you have pre-development. I assume that there's, there's no, I, I, I guess, you know, on the, the northern ends, extents of the project that that have um, you know basically you know are connected to the green spaces, you, you're not really required any types of berms or anything over there, right? I mean, it's just it's no. There, there's a there's a full perimeter berm around the outside of all of these conservation areas, uh, and and the elevation of that berm is set uh, off the top of my head. I think it's two feet above what is the control elevation. At which point water starts to run out. Now that berm obviously also provides us a, a maintenance access road for all the, the work we need to do out there. All right, let's see. Um, anonymous attendee went, again, post wildfire, did the natives fare better than the invasives? And would you recommend, recommend using fire to eradicate invasives as you're, as you're prepping a site for restoration? So unfortunately, the invasives survived better than the existing natives. Um, and so that was why I think I pointed out there in the slide that we, we took that opportunity to, to get in there and get, the, like I said, the, the Melaleuca tend to, to survive it if they're above a certain height um, and get those treated right away afterward. Um, in general, Brazilian pepper is almost stops prescribed fire. So it's, it's not a, the, the grassland species are better managed with fire than any of the, the woody species, I guess is the best overall generalization on it. Okay. Um, this is pretty good. I've never gotten through all the questions before and, and uh, there was one more. Um, this is kind of, you might've already answered this. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, after removal of pepper, malaleuca, and acacia, even with land clearing, are there seeds remaining in the seed bank that will re recolonize after flooding? Absolutely. Uh, you know that that's the the biggest single challenge, and and of course, the because many aside from the melaleuca, many of them are upland adapted species. If we can get water on top of it um, and get it flooded in a timely fashion many of those end up being controlled by that. Uh, for instance, you know, the Brazilian pepper won't start, you know, germinate and grow underwater. It creeps its way into aquatic systems um, when it starts on uplands. And so the, the desire is to get that area flooded as quickly as possible because it reduces the amount that we have to then track down during maintenance and surveillance events. Great. Okay. Um... So one more question. Anonymous attendee is uh, very inquisitive today. When complete, are there agreements in place to ensure long-term maintenance and monitoring of the site? 
Yeah, so the first of all, there's a conservation easement recorded in the favor of the water management district uh, so that, you know, strips any and all potential development rights and restricts any uses essentially to the trail system that we're working on. Uh, but more importantly, the, um, the development project uh, it has established a community development district, which is a, essentially a, a local taxing district. And that community development district is established in state law and has the obligation for perpetual maintenance of the conservation area. So the, the once again, you know, the development itself is actually paying for uh, the restoration and long-term perpetual maintenance. All right. Well, I think um, we can safely say we've run through the questions, but like I said, if you have any additional questions for Ed, please please send them to his email on, on posted on the screen. And um, Brenna, if you would please, um, I'd like to thank you very much, Ed. This has been, this has been a pleasure. I'm so, so pleased to be able to have a Florida project when I get to Boston. <laughs> so, um, We'd like, to, we'd like for everyone to, to recognize our sponsors. We have got some really cool sponsors this year. And um, whenever you get a chance, when you pull down the slide deck, uh, please please visit their, their websites. Um, in upcoming webinars, uh, please, Brenna, and we're going to have on August 17th, Conservation Planning in Municipalities by Rhonda Burnett. And um, then on the 21st, we'll have wet, wetland mitigation and the art of creating a water budget with Jennifer Van Houten. Um, and with that, we're gonna wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone so much for attending and um, I look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.